Thank you. Good evening, Ned Roots. I said, good evening, Ned Roots. It is my pleasure to stand before you today and share in a message and share in our collective vision of how we change this country. It is my honor to bring greetings to you all the way from Jackson, Mississippi, where this time last year, we won an election by winning 93% of the vote. And more importantly, we did so on an unapologetically progressive agenda. We have made the declaration in Jackson, Mississippi, that we intend to be the most radical city on the planet. This is a declaration that honestly comes out of what was initially a critique. It was a critique of myself. And prior to taking office, it was a critique of my father, who people suggested that maybe we were far too radical to bring people together. Maybe we were too radical to make the change that was necessary in the city of Jackson. And so I took it upon myself to look up what the word radical means. And when you look in the definition of radical, you find that a radical is a person who seeks change. And if we look outside of these walls and we look into our communities and we see a need for change, then the reality is that we need to be prepared to be as radical as the circumstances dictate we should be. When I look across history, at those individuals that we revere most in Mississippi, we look at Megger Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ida B. Wells, when we look at Martin Luther King, when we look at Jesus Christ, they were all radicals. As we look at the conditions that our communities have fallen into, we have to be honest with people and speak truth to power and tell people that you hadn't fallen in the state that you're in because someone has been too radical. In fact, I would argue the exact opposite, that you are in the conditions that you find yourself because someone has not fought hard enough. And so we claim this radical agenda. We wear it as a badge of honor where we declare that we want to be that radical city. Just recently, I had the pleasure of being at a convening of about 40 mayors from all across the world. And we were studying the issues that we're seeing not only in the nation, but what we're experiencing in the world where we see a rise of inequality. And so we were looking at case studies and taking this issue from the premise of what has gone wrong. There were a lot of thoughtful remarks. Many of the mayors were offering the question of globalization and looking at the wage disparities, looking at issues of education and the innovation versus workforce debate. And these were all important contributions to the discussion. But I must admit that I was a little perplexed in the question itself. I thought we were attacking the issue from a flawed perspective, and that was the perspective that something has gone wrong. And I stated that from where I stand, I saw a system that had not gone wrong, but a system that was working in the way that it was always intended to. A system where the ultra-wealthy get to make the decisions for everyone's economic interests. And so what we face and the problems we have is not a system that has gone wrong, but a system that is overproducing in the way that it was intended to work. And so we must identify that and make the changes in Jackson, Mississippi, in New Orleans, Louisiana, in Gary, Indiana, and across the nation and decide that we must have a new system that governs us. In Jackson, Mississippi, I've had the opportunity to talk to people all across the country. 
And as I've traveled around the country, I've been confronted with the question of how does it feel in Jackson, Mississippi after the election of Donald Trump? And I've shared with people, the Wednesday after Donald Trump was elected president, I woke up in Mississippi. And that means no matter whether Donald Trump is the president, no matter whether our country has experienced great booms or busts, we've always been at the bottom. And so as a Democratic Party, we have to make our politics local and start giving power to local areas so that they can become the places that rescue themselves. We ask the question, what do you do? When everywhere you look, you see a lack of integrity. You find it in yourself, and you begin to change the world from right where you're standing. That is our mission in Jackson, Mississippi. You see, I am the son of two organizers, two parents that had an understanding of justice and injustice, and they thought it was important to give it to me, just as important as giving my sister and I food, water, and shelter. They gave us a sense of community. They grounded us in something that was more important than ourselves as individuals, and I thank them for that. Because I had such a rich experience to live in the household with my heroes, I've had the propensity to speak on some of the larger issues of life, such as discrimination and self-determination and equality. But what you find when you're campaigning, when you're going door to door and you're talking about all these major issues, I knock on the door of a brother or sister in Jackson, Mississippi, and they tell me, yeah, that's, that's good, young brother. But how are you going to fix that pothole in the middle of my street? And so ultimately, we have to realize that that is our mission. Bridging pothole to pothole and community to community so people in Jackson, Mississippi understand that there is a community that looks just like theirs in New Orleans, Louisiana. A community that looks just like theirs in Gary, Indiana or Chicago, Illinois that is suffering from the same infrastructure problems. And ultimately, what we learn is that your issue is an issue of self-determination. An issue where you don't control the conditions which lead to a pothole being fixed. You don't control the conditions which dictate the, the quality of life that you would like to enjoy. And so we must come up with a new equation. We must dare to revolutionize electoral politics where we change the equation and people are given the power to govern themselves. That is what we are pushing for in Jackson, Mississippi. That is what we are fighting for by the creation of people's assemblies. Not only an opportunity to hear what the people want, but to have the people demand from their leadership what they want. No longer, no longer should we just allow someone to stand before us and give their vision for our lives. We have to be at the table. We have to dictate the policies, and we have to draft the leadership which represents our interests. What we are pushing for is a new idea. We are looking to push for a solidarity economy, an economy that no longer allows people to go through cycles of humiliation, cycles where you see people living in poverty, blighted communities, poor education, failing infrastructure. We must push a solidarity economy that allows us to show dignity in people's lives. We have to abandon the traditional models of how we develop cities, how we develop our nation, and make it more than just about great big edifices and moving people from one state of misery to the next. Our mission must be, instead of moving people away, we're going to lift people up.
This is what our cities demand. This is what our nations demand, and we have to speak truthfully and recognize that the models of development that we have been pursuing are failed models. We see a country that is over-dependent on a criminal justice system. And we have to be honest about that. We always tell our children that crime doesn't pay, but the reality is, is that crime pays very well. When you look at all of the people that are employed by crime, if crime stopped tomorrow, our country's economy would crash. First, you have the lawyers. Everybody loves the lawyers, right? You have the judges. You have police, and we have more police in our world today than we've ever had. We have our city police, and our county police, and our state police, and our federal police, and our secret police, and our secret police who watch the secret police. We have prison guards. We have parole officers and probation officers and all of the companies that contract with our prisons. And so all of this depends on an over-incarceration of our society. And we ask the question of why we see civil unrest all across the nation. Because we are pushing a failed economic strategy that, that, that makes certain that we have that. It demands that we over-incarcerate. And the statistics show us that that doesn't make our communities any safer than they have become, than they have always been. We have a country that has more people incarcerated than any other country in the world. We have more law enforcement than any other country in the world. Yet and still, we have more crime than any other country in the world. And so we have to make certain that we are bold enough to speak truthfully to ourselves. Today, in Jackson, Mississippi, I was honored to have the young people from Parkland, Florida, in Jackson, Mississippi. Please give them a round of applause. I'm tremendously proud of these young people because they remind me of one of my favorite quotes from a revolutionary, a psychologist, and a great author, Dr. Franz Fanon. And what Dr. Franz Fanon wrote in his book, Wretched of the Earth, is that each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. And so we see young people across the nation, like the kids in Parkland, Florida, who are daring to take up that calling. Young people who no longer want people to speak to them, they want to speak for themselves. We must take this energy and concretize it. Concretize it all around the nation. Concretize it in the Deep South, where there is opportunity for Democrats to win. <laughs> Organize it. Take it from the mystical, from the mysterious, and identify what our message must be. As we see a country which is gripped with school shootings from coast to coast, we have to speak to the uncomfortable truths of what gun violence looks like in our nation. And as a black man, I long for the day where I have as many rights in this nation as a gun does. Yes, you see, we have to come to the understanding that Martin Luther King began to come to not long before he died. Martin had a conversation with Harry Belafonte not long before he died, and what he said, he said, listen, Harry, I'm beginning to wonder. I'm beginning to fear what we are integrating into. You see, I believe we're going to win this integration struggle, but, but I'm beginning to fear that we may be integrating into a burning house. 
He said, I see a country that abuses labor, that abuses working people. And he, he said, I fear integrating into a house that looks like that if people can't be fed, if people can't take care of their families then it's senseless to just come together on social issues and walk Mississippi fields together. And ultimately, we have to come to a place where we're sharing goods, resources, and power. And if we can't come to that place, then it isn't worth integrating into that, and I fear that my dream has become a nightmare. So, in conclusion, what we have before us are two critical options. We have the option of economics for the people and by the people, or the option of economics by a few people for themselves. This has been the traditional model. And I believe that if we are sincere in our mission, sincere in our mission to touch the lives of individuals, sincere in our mission to make certain that Democrats take hold of offices and effectuate the change that they want to see, we can no longer be afraid. We can no longer hide in the shadows and be afraid to move forward on progressive agendas. For if Jackson, Mississippi can push forward a progressive agenda by 93 percent in a space that has been the location of some of the most horrible suffering in our history, if progress can be obtain, obtained right here in the belly of the beast, progress can be obtained anywhere, and we must fight for it. Thank you so much.